So this is my uh, provocative presentation. So I expect you to stay somehow provoked by questions that I will try to raise with this presentation and um, engage, please engage with these questions in the chat box. And after I'm done with this uh, full um, a series of questioning. <laughs> um, so let's have an open dialogue then. This will take around 30 minutes and then we'll see how far we go with the discussion. Um, as uh, Carlos already presented me, I'm a, a currently a uh, service design and experience design professor and this is a more critical view on my field, which is definitely not the mainstream <laughs> perspective over the topic. I'm questioning is it ethical, is it aesthetical to design an experience for someone else who is different from you? Well, let's start from the um, key fundamental question of this field, which is, is it possible really to design user experience, to design experience for someone else? Is it possible that someone else's experience is, is designed? Well, most scholars in this field, they would say it's not possible. While uh, most uh, practitioners in the industry would say it is indeed possible. And I am a scholar and I believe it is possible and it's better to believe it's possible because then we now must have definitely a critical perspective of it and especially responsibility. How do I teach this to my students? Well, I've been conducting several experiments on critical pedagogy in experience design and this one was my favorite one. Um, we um, slowly ate Sonho de Valsa, which is a very traditional Brazilian candy that um, somehow help, help, let students to remember their childhood experiences of eating this candy. But they have to do it so slowly, eyes closed, they have to smell it, they have to lick it, they have to detach the different layers of the candy before they definitely, they finally eat. <laughs> and chew it and, and I ask them to wait before they, uh, they, they do every of these steps so they can perceive how much information and sensorial uh, stimulation is in built into this simple product. After they do that with the, uh, the candy, I also do the same thing with a WhatsApp application in their phones so they would somehow uh, separate into layers the way the interface is designed and they will perceive how much knowledge and design knowledge has been put into uh, the small micro details of this interface and they perceive how much of their experience everyday experience have been designed in this way so they agree with my uh, uh, position that indeed uh, experiences can be designed however uh, believing that it can be designed or not is not enough. You need to understand how it works to um, take responsibility for it. And I use this model, which is quite different from most uh, experience design models out there, uh, because it slowly let students understand their places in a uh, society that is divided into classes, genders, races, and so on. But first, let's start with what they already know they know that they are targeting a user and they expect that the user experience will uh, somehow uh, fulfill the wishes or the goals, the business goals of the designers. So they expect this arrow coming from the users towards the designers. But the designers also have their own experience of their own, which I call designer experience. And, and I emphasize that designers, they have this um, privilege of being recognized as designers while users are not recognized. And, and the students ask, why the hell are you uh, framing things in this way? Because users are indeed designing their own user experience as well. Like any human being, we are always designing our experiences. However, the authorship of this experience is uh, sometimes not acknowledged because of something uh, broader, something which is more historical, which is oppression. And then after we realize how oppression is getting ingrained into design experiences, uh, we can somehow discuss ethics from another perspective, from a much more critical perspective. Uh, in terms of oppression studies, designers, they are this so privileged social group, which I call 
uh, the self and the users they are this uh, other uh, group the underprivileged social group and there are di diverse social groups in the other in the self and in the oppression relationship the self which is more powerful who historically have won the uh, the struggle to for predominance which is described by uh, philosopher Hegel and later on um, systematized by Franz Fanon, Paulo Freire and several authors they said that the self, the oppressor, tries to oppress the other and makes the other uh, believe that he is dependent, depending on the self for living up their lives <laughs> and, and that's uh, also experience design uh, in a broad perspective which must be held accountable if you are looking from a critical perspective so let's see how um, we uh, unfold this uh, model into certain ethical questions the first one the most most obviously is it anti-ethical uh, whatsoever to design experience of the other to intervene with someone else's life in this way well, NK Ultra ex, uh, project uh, conducted by the CIA um, of, of uh, surely under uh, secrecy during the 60s and 70s um, definitely shows up that it is anti-ethical and uh, people suffer a lot if you can try to control their experiences by using some drugs or some uh, media um, uh, conditioning methods the Warmwood documentary Netflix Netflix uh, platform uh, tells part of this story, which is terrible, and it's probably one of the worst moments of uh, humanity trying to design experiences. But it's still it, this is the past of experiences that, that we must uh, uh, we must criticize, must uh, discuss uh, up to of today because some of the elements of uh, human um, com behavior conditioning are still present in everyday lives today. In, uh, more subtle ways, but still um, anti-ethical. Well, but then is it designing the same as controlling the experience? Some people that look at this uh, uh, social experiments or mind controlling experience, they would think it's the same as designing. Well, uh, I wouldn't say so. I believe that designing is not the same as controlling and design is also not the same as um, working for the CIA and doing this kind of experiments or psychological or social experiments. It's not definitely not the same because you can uh, design something to be open and for interaction and for um, open-ended uh, results and interactions. For example, Bardo Arante, which is a great place in Florianopolis city, uh, you can go there and you can leave a message and attach to the windows or the the ceiling or the walls, and then you can write basically everything you want. So. The designers open up this possibility. They, they, they definitely cannot control what people are writing there and what people, especially what people are reading. Therefore, I believe it's design is not the same as control. Then uh, designers might think, well, if I don't have control, I don't have, ex <laughs> I don't have responsibility for it, right? Well, my experience of raising a child suggests that we do have <laughs> responsibility for things that we cannot fully control. A child it has to grow for its own sake, has to find its own life, has to develop in a certain way that's usually, it's not definitely the same way that uh, the parents would think it's perfect or ideal. Uh, but still, the parents have to uh, take care that this child is not uh, doing something against the law or doing something that's against the child herself or itself, uh, himself. That's responsibility in a nutshell. And my son, I'm really proud of him because uh, he was at the age of uh, 13, he was even presented to Dax presentation uh, because uh, he was developed autonomously and said things that he believed to a, a very interested audience. And I'm somehow partially responsible for that, but he definitely deserves most of the credit. That's how we possibly may relate uh, to users. So we need to take responsibility, but for sure not full responsibility. How do we do that? How do we take responsibility for the experience design for the other? Well, there are several attempts, several initiatives going on in the field. For example, Mike Monteiro's uh, Designers Code of Ethics is a great uh, initiative that has attracted a lot of attention. Uh, he published this um, 
this text uh, in 2017 in, in the Medium website and a lot of people started to discuss on the internet, we organized conferences around that, he even published a book on it. But still, I don't believe this code of ethics is enough. <laughs> I believe that we need to do way more of that. And uh, founding or opening the design ethics consultancies, consultancies around that is also fine, but they are definitely not enough, especially if you write a code of ethics and then later on you open up an ethics consultancy, how uh, transparent and uh, detached is that code of ethics. And, is it uh, good that co uh, people that work at one uh, one person from one company is writing the code of ethics? Isn't that a task for um, a work association, for example, like in uh, IXDA, my field, Interaction Design Association? Where's the code of ethics of, of that field? I don't know. This discussion should definitely go beyond uh, consultancies and uh, medium websites. And I believe it's going to... Uh, to a, another level, if we open up uh, non-profit organizations that have less in commercial interest, or at least they have some uh, mechanisms for being you know, uh, held accountable for this work, so we don't get onto a conflict of interests. For example, preaching some design ethics principle that helps to sell your consultancy. And I believe that uh, yeah, the, the non-profit uh, organization Human Technology, founded by uh, Tristan Harris, who is featured in this. Uh, uh, Netflix documentary about social network uh, biases. It's already uh, uh, something interesting, better, even more organized uh, than just uh, doing the regular consultancy work, but still not enough. We need uh, definitely uh, work associations and in the uh, design field, we don't have so many of them, especially in the, my experience in design field, the service design. Uh, we do have some of them, but they are not as advanced, for example, as Alphabet Workers Union. I mean, these guys are really pushing uh, forward, uh, criticizing how these companies, these huge big tech companies, are uh, not asking enough ethical questions or even firing their employees who ask uh, ethical questions inside and, and sometimes um, would uh, push for losing some business opportunities that go against uh, humanity at large. And I believe this uh, working union or trade unions, they are essential for us to quit questioning things. Otherwise, the, the, the big companies, the CEOs, the board of directors, they would always win against the workers that raise a critical voice. And to finalize of these initiatives, I want to emphasize that uh, the work that we are doing in academia, the work that doing, being done by philosophers who are mostly uh, uh, tax paid uh, employees, uh, the tax, tax place uh, servants, they, they work for uh, universities that are mostly funded by the government and your taxes. And, and, and it's important because otherwise this kind of work would never get funded. Companies that are being anti-ethical want to fund work that hold them accountable by uh, some kind of a obscure philosopher. Uh, this example of uh, Peter Paul Verbeek, a, a Dutch philosopher who definitely inspired my work, uh, is very important because he helped myself understand the relationship between ethics and aesthetics in the book What Things Do, and later on the relationship between uh, uh, design and morality, and the way how we can moralize our society by designing technology in an ethical way. And these two books are marvelous ways of starting to understand this topic in a much more deep way than you, what you previously have seen. Uh, previous initiatives. But still, this is not enough. Enough is to keep asking these kind of questions while we moralize our practices. So uh, ethics uh, is not just a, an old philosophy from Greece that we have to remember that it does exist once in a while. Ethics is something to be practiced in everyday life, so we must ask those questions and find uh, multiple answers depending on the situation we are in. And let's uh, ask some further questions on our practice so I can perhaps uh, demonstrate how this applies to our everyday experience. Um, there are a lot of different uh, design approaches out there and design methods, and I'm just picking up possibly one of the most popular nowadays in my field, which is called the double diamond. And the double diamond, uh, it, it begins from very nice, interesting moral principles on how you can take care about other people's opinion and not to cut them out of the process too soon. So you have this very uh, 
moment, the convergent moment, and then you have let people express themselves. However, uh, double diamond, uh, and like any other method, uh, can easily fall prey to immoral practices and become uh, a tool for immoralized society, not immoralized, because people stop questioning uh, the model. They believe it's 100% good. If you apply uh, this double diamond mon model, you will be already uh, perfect or good, 100% uh, nice. But that's not always the case. And, and should it become not the case, because this double diamond model is often used to aggregate data collected from the other through data mining or any other extractive method uh, that does not ask even for permission for collecting the data or it asks for permission but not in the way that the user understands and especially it, it, what it does with the data is never returned back to the user so the user does not understand, does not uh, cannot criticize the representations made out of uh, the data and they may even be put into some kind of a stereotype uh, representation that totally distorts, distorts their experiences and that later on have some cost because it will put users into an unsafe or uncomfortable position in their lives through their designs based on this uh, uh, collected data. So, to extend further uh, this double diamond uh, scrutinizing, I want to add a, 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 an analogy to this uh, literal diamond extraction mining activity. Uh, if the social, I would argue that the social impact of the double diamond is similar to the environmental impact of diamond mines. And Dillon Martian, uh, an artist, uh, takes pictures of the um, the diamond mines and this one is striking because to, he shows the contrast to extract um, diamonds that would uh, be of the size of a human fist you need to extract four um, huge uh, 400 huge square meters um, that of, of, of land and this will never return back to its uh, original shape for such a short amount of uh, valuable material and we, we might also be doing this with double diamonds if we uh, um, extend the analogy between uh, minerals and data then we can see that every double diamond process is behind a social creator so to speak of silenced others with no stakes in design people that uh, might have done something that has been tracked by some uh, uh, data tracking system and that person is not sometimes uh, acknowledged that uh, has been uh, collect the data has been collected in this way but uh, most of times the person does not know and the person cannot have control of that data and especially the interpretation of that data and designers they take this data and the design is interpreted and designers sometimes uh, do things on behalf of users they act as their advocates as their, um, their representatives in, uh, in a big tech company or in kind of a company that is designing experiences. And these people are silenced. Right? They, don't, they, they are silenced because designers and companies believe they didn't have, these people have no stakes inside. And, and most of the case, these people, these users, these oppressed users are black people. There's definitely some work on trying to incorporate uh, black uh, designers in, uh, into user experience design teams. And that's great because and black people can tell what they think about uh, experience design in this way but that's also not enough I mean we definitely need to uh, question the method that is creating this whole uh, situation it's not just a matter of switching people from one side of the other in the oppression uh, structure if we want to uh, challenge oppression we need to have, to have structural change and that starts with truly listening the other in design and participatory design is one of the uh, oldest uh, design approach that takes such a commitment of definitely hearing what uh, users are saying and changing the design because people say uh, in, the, in, their, in their own word, their own position analysis and uh, they put some energy into that by participating in this situation. So for example, I'm showing here a project we uh, uh, we participated in uh, London in 2014 
uh, organized by Architectures and Frontiers, trying to include people who have who are about to be uh, uh, moved from uh, their housing uh, from another place in the city, and they wanted to say what uh, something to the city hall, and we helped them to synthesize uh, their complaints. And later on, we compiled some visualizations of different voices, the diverse voices of uh, the this, uh, inhabitants, the, the people who dwell in, in these uh, condoms. And then, and then these uh, people, they have different perspe perspectives. We have to take care for not silencing their uh, perspective. Even if, if what they said was something that we found uh, trivial, we had to represent in some way. So we should not diminish their voices, and, and we uh, took responsibility for that. Later on, we organized uh, a meeting with uh, city hall representatives. Uh, there were uh, 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 people who lived their association and um, some uh, religious uh, representatives. So we tried to have a debate on what to do about uh, this removal and uh, this huge construction that was going to happen nearby. And sometimes the other would be not present, and then we would have to defend their voices, raise against uh, some criticism that would uh, try to discredit their voice. That's very important. Designers have to take to side with the other. But what if the other says something anti ethical? This is a plot twist, right? Uh, well, in Brazil, that happens a lot. Passengers, for example, I'm take this uh, Uber Comfort design uh, project, uh, this Uber Comfort design feature. Passenger and drivers agreed on the option to ride in silence in Uber Comfort, and, but the one who chose that was the, uh, the passenger, not the driver. The driver could not choose if he wanted to or she wanted to uh, drive in silence. That was an option that the passenger has to pay an extra, a bonus, uh, which is called the Uber Comfort premium service. This is unethical because there is no um, uh, power or agency uh, symmetry in this uh, functionality uh, it can be considered moral but it's not ethical but then how can designers ethically question something that is considered moral by society that happens a lot this is just an example well we have been exploring some uh, Brazilian methods for raising ethical questions that are very artistic and for example theater of the techno press as we call it raise ethical questions through acting and debating it is drawn from the work of Augusto Boal, who invented the theater of the press. Now we uh, adapted them from something to the theater of the techno press, people that are oppressed through technology. In this case, this uh, digital service called Uber Comfort. And we uh, held this um, play uh, in front of an audience of the future designers and computer scientists. And we asked them, do you think this is ethical? Do you think this is moral? And they had to dwell, uh, to to uh, struggle with this definition of what is morality and what is uh, ethicality and, and how does it apply to our situation. And we had great conversation about this and we started uh, developing further this method. I'm sure we'll later on more examples of the other technical press. But then how can designers move from ethically solving wicked problems to ethically posing wicked problems? Uh, most of the current design thinking and uh, experience design and service design and literature and uh, approaches in practice, they would say uh, there are some problems that we cannot solve uh, entirely, then we just solve it the best we can. Uh, the most satisfying solution, which is based on ethically uh, choosing between uh, what is possible and what is not possible. Uh, so there's no optimal solution, it's just ethical. And I don't believe this is a very interesting way of, of uh, referring to ethics. Therefore, this, uh, we organized, uh, we actually uh, held another theater of the techno press uh, play in a conference called Attending to the Futures in Germany. It was a remote conference. And this Wicked Problems, Wicked Designs play in 2021 uh, raised uh, the wicked problems of wicked problems, so to speak. So we showed uh, how design thinking by not asking really uh, true ethical questions, just by ethically trying to solve things without understanding what they are. Uh, solving and perhaps they are solving people's lives, which is unsolvable by definition. That the people are not problem, but that's how, uh, for example, in the play, uh, a special character designer tries to frame the uh, period dignity situation of women in Brazil who cannot afford paying for the sanitary pads. 
And uh, we had an interesting discussion again. So the theory of the technical press is really an interesting way of raising ethical questions related to the practice of design. But what, what can we do when we cannot uh, eliminate such unethical functionality, even if you believe it's unethical and the company uh, wants to, to do it, the government that we're working for wants to do it, and uh, they are even threatening to, to, um, to fire you if you do not design it, for, if you do not integrate into the design this unethical functionality. Well, you can pass on the ethical question to the other, although this is not so responsible. Here is an example from uh, Twitter, uh, wants to review this uh, before tweeting, <laughs> so if you just retweet uh, uh, some kind of news item there that you haven't taken time, what Twitter thinks it has enough time to leave, then uh, uh, Twitter would uh, show, raise this alarm box. And I think this is not enough, definitely not enough. And Twitter is somehow not taking full responsibility for what sharing and spreading fake news. But still, it's raising some, uh, at least a bit of conscience about this. Well, what if we cannot even change uh, design content and we cannot touch the content itself? Well, we can do a lot with aesthetics. Aesthetics alone can already express morality. This is uh, the final work of Humberto Salmaso, a student of mine who was uh, developing this um, homage to COVID victims on uh, Twitter bot system and uh, in the left side you see his first uh, sketch of the screen uh, that draws some uh, refer visual references from video games for example the number of victims on the, uh, uh, the, the bottom left side of the screen uh, then if you move just move to the center of the screen where typically um, the number of lives are not being shown in video games it just totally uh, destroy this reference so you, you do not uh, somehow try to lo look like these lives are unreal in, like in the game but it, it is still an aesthetic pleasing uh, design but taking care that he's not drawing the wrong analogy so what does ethics has to do with aesthetics then what is the relationship in there well uh, behind every aesthetics, there's always an implicit ethics that is a way of living society. That's a very interesting insight I took from Peter Paul, for, Peter Paul for Bacon, his book on what same things do from 2005. And uh, let me take you a contemporary example. Animojis allows you to express emotions to the other without showing your face, just like carnival masks. And that's an ethical uh, decision this, uh, besides being also an aesthetic decision. And you do not show yourself fully, you protect yourself with a mask and sometimes you can even be harsh or more uh, strong on your emotions uh, without feeling that you are putting yourself on the line because you can always tell, well, I was just wearing this mask and playing this character. But this is definitely an ethical operation that allows you more room or leeway for the same things that you wouldn't say without the mask. That's the same carnival. And people are choosing uh, symbols and uh, icons and emojis with the same kind of a mind of uh, trying to say things that they wouldn't say otherwise. And these aesthetic choices, uh, they follow class, race, gender tastes. And the social groups that I spoke before, they are uh, pretty much uh, a good way of predicting what people would choose in their aesthetic choices. For example, in this uh, uh, study conducted by Barbieri, Camacho and Colados, they found out that um, people use uh, uh, their uh, the same kind of emoji according to their different uh, color tone schemes, as you can see on the top, and also the gender was quite consistent. Uh, these choices and make make us uh, think about uh, what, what 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 how does these the choices of emoji also reflect um, their oppositionality in the world, and how does it also reproduce some oppressive. Uh, and exclusionary tastes. Uh, let me pick another example from Tinder and the way Asian people and the black people are mostly swiped off the screen and, and, and not being uh, matched to other to white users, for example, because they don't like it, because uh, this liking is not just individual uh, choice, it's a taste uh, developed among uh, white supremacists, people who would never marry, would never want a relationship, would never want to meet someone else is not of a different race 
And that's something that Tinder should never do because it's reproducing the same kind of structural oppression elsewhere in society. And if you can design, otherwise we should do it, otherwise it's anti-ethical. Anti so there's no neutral aesthetics. You can, uh, Tinder and any color or company cannot say, we are being neutral here, we are applying the same rules, so all kinds of races, gender. And no, if you are doing that, you are being oppressive, you are being anti-ethical. There's nothing really neutral in aesthetics. The word aesthetics means <laughs> stimulate the senses. How can you not stimulate if you are being neutral? There's no neutrality in aesthetics. Let me pick an example from uh, uh, Brazilian government um, figures on the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, this is the first screen. We see modern minimalist and clean graphics trying to hide the real and most striking information, which is the, the rate of death. No, I mean, how many people were dying out of COVID? And, and he, this is the current number, about uh, 7, 700,000 people. That's a lot of people uh, uh, die, who uh, died of this disease. That could be prevented, but the graphic design really makes a lot of effort uh, with a clean, modern and minimalist design trying to emphasize the information that the government thinks it's more important, which is the number of people that have recovered from uh, the disease on the left side and uh, compare this the, the previous screen with this other one that was the initial uh, the data dashboard data dashboard for the pandemics in Brazil was was built by another Minister of Health who uh, directly criticized uh, Jair Bolsonaro's presidency and was later fired by him and then the design, the previous design was uh, they replaced this one. So you can see the lethality or the the, the rate of, of death is an important information. It has the the strongest weight, uh, the most the brighter color. But you can see that this is also part of a a, a much wider layout uh, strategy that uses a lot of colors that tries to be more. Um, uh, try to draw more attention to the criticality of these, these numbers. And this is what I would call postmodern exuberant diverse graphics. They are mostly typical of the aesthetics of the press. I wouldn't say that this is very much realizing everything what I mean by aesthetics of the press, but still, uh, the Minister of Health at that time was trying to show up that a lot of people were dying and these people uh, were mostly uh, poor people, black people, women and so on, oppressed in a way. So it is, is it possible then to train the senses to criticize the aesthetics of the oppressor and appreciate the aesthetics of the oppressor, the oppressed, sorry. So uh, it's, it's definitely something that we have to develop in design schools, but currently we don't have so many uh, uh, references for doing that. We all um, then have organized uh, some I'm remote online courses called Designs of the Press uh, since last year through the Design and Oppression Network, a group of uh, researchers, petitioners spread through Brazil who are working uh, against oppression in several uh, fronts. And uh, this course has been marvelous, uh, marvelous uh, experience and, and we also have another cohort starting next week. So if you want to uh, learn more about this topic, please sign up, it's for free. And in one of the exercises last year, we tried to train and retrain our senses on um, deconstructing and reconstructing this image of the greenwashed uh, Coke bottle that was plant-based, but still uh, kept uh, feeding people with so much sweet that they would probably get a disease out of that. Then uh, by trying to uh, redesign the, this Coke bottle, the students, they learn how to um, subvert the capitalist uh, and uh, oppressive in, uh, design in general and turn it back uh, into the interest of the users, of the people organized. This is a theater of the press game called Homage to Greet that we adapted to the remote uh, experience of, the, of our course. In the university, uh, Federal University of Technology Paraná, we have this laboratory of design against oppression who holds a, a lot of face-to-face uh, -face events and uh, the, one of the last ones was this uh, uh, advertising campaign uh, and collage, digital collage uh, using Photoshop uh, to 
combine different uh, uh, popular uh, expressions against oppression into one new uh, expression. And our students are definitely learning how to read and also write the aesthetics of the press and uh, diverge themselves from European and even US uh, design references that uh, sometimes does not have uh, so much relevance to our own um, context of living. And uh, a third thing that we do at, uh, to develop this uh, sensibility is to train students to try and taste something new every day. For example, even a new kind of beverage that they wouldn't like, it's but they have to try it out and be open not to be enclosed in this uh, taste-based uh, social network bubbles. What if none of this is possible then? What if the degree of freedom to take ethical decisions is next to zero? What if you are being oppressed to oppress the other? What if you are in such a kind of a warlike situation? Well, if you, there is no ethical decisions left to be taken, I'm sorry to say, but you are being treated as a tool, not as a human designer. <laughs> it's better to resign soon than wait to be replaced by an artificial intelligence agent, like we depicted it into another theater, the Technopressed play, precisely on this topic on the, the the automation of design work and its consequences on the responsibility and so on what if there are no remaining job posts for designers and everything is automated by uh, these uh, ai machines well um i have to say that you can delegate decisions to machines but you cannot delegate the responsibility for this as mit's moral machine experiment also show very convincingly if you choose uh, some certain number of uh, options for the AI machine driving an automated car, you are not uh, delegating the moral decisions on that. You are definitely reproducing your, uh, your morality of the social group that you are part of. And then this social group is also responsible for what the car is doing. So designers are precisely hired for that, to take responsibility for the ethical and aesthetic decisions delegated to things. Ethics and aesthetics, then, is not just a matter of design thinking, which I'm definitely trying to criticize and raise critical awareness about. However, it is a matter of design consciousness, and I think there's a lot of research and practice to develop further in this uh, direction of moving to, from design matters of design thinking to matters of design consciousness, which includes ethics and aesthetics at its core. So, uh, I hope that I have provoked you enough. So, what do you do about this? I want to first thank you and uh, say that there's a lot of references that you can check later on. And I invite you for having an interesting debate on this. So, please join us.